Hello, everyone. Welcome. Very nice to see you all. Thank you for joining today. Oh, we've got Gavin Duden here joined. <laughs> How wonderful. Hi, Gavin. Good to see you. So, can everybody just say a hello? Yes, we hear you fine in the text chat if you're ready for it. Very nice that you're joining. And we're looking forward to Graham session. Do you hear us okay? Hiya, everybody. Irena was first. She gets a prize. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Greetings from Sweden. Fantastic. Um, we are, well, Graham is in Mexico City, right? Sophia, where are you? I'm in Leicester, UK. Still? I'm in Norwich in the UK. I'm in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Even though it looks like Japan, but... <laughs> yeah, that's what I would like to be. <laughs> and Nikki? I'm in Brno in the Czech Republic. Hi, and myself near Heidelberg in Germany at the moment. So it's very nice to see you all. From Spain, from Egypt. And uh, Rose, where are you from? Where are you located at the moment? Lovely to see you. So we've got Uruguay, Brazil. Here we go. <laughs> Fantastic. Turkey, awesome. So where in the world are you actually celebrating Good Friday today? Well, obviously in Germany, but the churches are empty. Everybody goes, oh, you know, no, no Good Friday services at all. What about you, Julia? Where are you based? I think you can, can you unmute yourself? I'm wondering. Uh, sorry, I have to, I think we unmute. Uh, not. Hang on. One second. Julia, so that you can say something. Say hello. I can't find you for some reason. Here we go. Just a word about that, actually. We, we've muted everybody by default, but if you want to put your hand up, either virtually or using your camera, when if you want to use the mic then do so and one of the co-hosts will will allow you to speak during the webinar so julia welcome hi uh, hi everybody uh, hi julia hi uh, if uh, those who don't know me well uh, i am based in in israel and uh, i am a regular iit full presenter fantastic who will just say welcoming words and uh, nice, Sophia nice also. Here. Nice to see you. <laughs> and if everybody else then, um, well, comes on webcam first and then goes off webcam. <laughs> but Sophia will let you know. And yes. also Graham, Graham himself, he will let us know what he's planning to do today. We're looking forward My to gosh. a lot of interactive sessions. I'm going to focus on admitting people of the waiting room and stay in the background if that's okay. Great, thank, thank you. you thank, you, thank, you. thank you very much. So hi everyone and welcome to the third l 2 seek Friday, which is a series of webinars that the l 2 seek committee has put together. So I'm the ITF l 2 seek coordinator. l 2 seek for those of you who don't know uh, the l 2 seek it stands for Learning Technology Special Interest Group. And ITEFO is the International Association of Teachers of English as a foreign language. So we are part of the big ITEFO family and part of our mission as a SEEK, as a special interest group, is to support teachers with their professional development with regards to technology integration in the classroom, physical or virtual. So. Uh, we have been studying the use of technology for many, many years, and we are here to support teachers in these challenging times that face-to-face -face instruction has been stopped, has been <clears throat> challenged. So we have put together this series of webinars, and we will be sharing advice and best practice on how to make 
teaching a better experience for you, the teacher, but also the students during the pandemic. Now, we are very well aware that teaching online can be rewarding, but also challenging in many ways, and that actually moving a face-to-face -face course online as a response to a pandemic may be overwhelming for most teachers. So we are here uh, for this very reason, and we will be talking about technology, about online pedagogy, about affordances of digital spaces, but also restrictions and limitations, because technology is not the silver bullet, not everything is fantastic and easy. So during the, the webinar, feel free to interact with uh, participants, ask questions that Graham will be happy to answer later on. And please, please let us know how we can support you do, during this transition. Um, what topics would you like us to consider for the next webinars, for example? So without further ado, um, passing on the mic to Vicky, who will introduce our very own Graham Stanley. Hi, everybody. This is Vicky from Buenos Aires. And I am really pleased to be introducing Graham today. Graham uh, is our own newsletter editor for the LT SIG, uh, currently based in Mexico, working for the British Council, uh, and has a huge experience, vast experience with remote teaching, as he was project manager for the uh, Save Val project in Uruguay. Uh, so who, who better to... Uh, guide us through how to motivate and engage students online. Uh, so without further ado, this is Graham with you all. Welcome. Thank you very much, Vicky. Uh, thank you, fellow committee members of the LTC for that um, and for this series of webinars. Uh, just a, a few words before I start. By default, everybody is muted. Um, but if there are times during this um, presentation workshop, whatever we want to call it, that we do require input. So you can either use the chat or you can put your hand up either using your camera if you've got it turned on or the virtual um, hands up feature, which I'm going to let you try and find in your controls. Um, I think there are problems if you're on an iPad. Um, or a tablet with finding that. But otherwise, if you're on a computer, you should have no problems. Uh, right, so what I'll be talking about is remote teaching, communicating effectively and keeping learners' attention. There are four parts to this. The first part will be uh, my reflections on remote teaching and uh, communicating with learners and keeping them engaged. Then I'll be looking at CPD about remote teaching and some of the things that I've learned over the years that I've been involved in it. Then we'll have uh, a section just looking at green screens on Zoom in particular or other places where you can use them. And then finally, we'll open up the floor for questions and answers for everybody. So without further ado, let me move on. So just a bit more um, information about my experience in, of remote teaching. So as Vicky said, from 2012, I was uh, employed by the British Council as a project manager on the Sabalan Inglés project, which is a big project in Uruguay. And I know we have Irene from Uruguay in the room and I think Polly from Cordoba, Argentina, who's also involved in the project. I'm sure we may have some more as well. Um, Basically, we teach over 75,000 students, primary students, remotely. But it's a very different type of remote teaching than the, the remote teaching that a lot of us are involved in at the moment, which is teaching students, with, with whether they be adults or young learners from home. However, some of the things that we learned on that project are still very relevant now. So I did that and was in Uruguay until 2018. In 2019, I moved to Mexico City, but I'm still senior responsible officer of the, um, of the project. So I'm still involved. Um, I also authored a couple of books, one that are relevant 
Language Learning with Technology that was published in 2013. And then the latest one, I was editor of a book of case studies and research that came from the programme uh, in Uruguay and elsewhere where we've been remote teaching, uh, which is free to download from that link. The slides I'll make available later, so you don't have to scribble down the, uh, the, the links of anything you see here. Okay, so before I start proper, what I'd like to draw your attention to is a special edition of the newsletter that I uh, edit along with my colleagues present in the room today and others. Um, and this is available not only to learning technology special interest group members, but to all IETEFL members. We've made this available to everybody who is a member of IETEFL. In order to, to access it, you need to log into the website um, and go to my resources and you should be able to find it and then be able to download it or view it from there. It's quite an interesting um, issue with lots of very good advice from the people that are listed there, Carol, Nick, and Lindsay, Gavin, Helen, and Marion, um, who all have experience of online teaching. So I think it's particularly appropriate for this, uh, this time. And I recommend that all of you um, have a look at it and hopefully you'll find it useful. So I'm gonna move on now to remote teaching and some of the, um, the things I've learned about keeping students engaged and motivated. But first of all, what is remote teaching? Remote teaching is the term that we use in the British Council and in lots of other places for what some people call teaching live online. So in other words, it's the practice of teaching a language, remote language teaching, um, live online through video conferencing. Um, now, there are lots of different ways you can do that. As I said, in Uruguay, we teach using, on the screen on the right-hand side, you can see a picture of the video conferencing. We teach from special teaching points in remote teaching centers um, to students in classrooms, um, primary students in classrooms, where normally there is uh, a responsible adult, a classroom teacher, a regular classroom teacher, who's responsible for the classroom management, et cetera. But of course, remote teaching, as we all know, um, these days is more typical to find with students at home, which requires a very different type of approach, of course, especially where things like child protection are concerned. Um, however, I think with both of these forms of remote teaching, one thing to keep in mind is that usually you would want not only to do remote teaching, I, I, the, li the live online teaching, but also to do the asynchronous um, learning and teaching as well, which usually takes place through use of a learning management system. That's not something I'm going to talk about a lot today, but it is something that is probably very important to have as well as the remote teaching aspect. And also with all forms of remote teaching, I think it's very important to keep in mind what Stephen Back said in 2003, referring to all technology really. The objective of, uh, of use of technology in teaching, in language teaching, is really to try and achieve this thing he said co was called normalization. In other words, if we can make the technology as far as possible disappear to become invisible, then that is, that is partly uh, what we need to do. In other words, what you want to achieve as a remote teacher is that you forget that the students are not actually physically present in the room with you. Now, that's very difficult to do, but actually I have observed remote teaching sessions, lessons, where basically it's, it's the students and the teacher together sharing things, learning, and really the fact that they are physically distanced um, doesn't become important. And if you can achieve that, that's, uh, uh, that's success, you know, as far as I'm concerned. Right, so first uh, input from you, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight aspects of remote teaching when it comes to engaging and motivating students. I think that are important to take into account and I'll be looking um, at these. What do they mean? So the first one, what are the two missing words there? e-contact and presence. 
Okay, Linda is first to answer there. Eye contact and speaker presence. Okay, I'll come to the answers in a minute. What about the next one? Don't just be a a talking head. Very good, Leanne. That's it. What about B-I? More difficult. B-I, what's the missing words there? Any idea? U of V? N V? They're becoming quite B innovated, said Helen. Use of the C. What's the C that's missing there? Body language. B L. Yeah, it might be B L actually rather than B I. B F with the T. Use of the camera. Yeah, that's right, Jan. Trouble. Trouble what? Okay, let me move on to the answers. So these are the eight aspects that I think I would like to look at today. Eye contact and screen presence. Don't be just a talking head. Body language, use of voice, minimize distractions, use of the camera, be familiar with the technology and troubleshooting. So without further ado, let me move on. So eye contact and screen presence. How can you best establish eye contact with students when teaching remotely? Well, um, if you look directly into the camera lens rather than the screen, I'm looking at the screen now. Now I'm looking at the camera. Then students will feel you're looking at them in the eye. And this is particularly important if you have an external camera plugged into your computer that is some distance away from the screen, which is my case. So my screen is about here and my camera is a few inches above the screen. So if I can look into the camera when I'm addressing students, for example, then it does make a difference. Uh, it's not much of a problem with fixed webcam on a laptop as the camera's placed just above the screen. But I think even here, if you focus on the lens, it makes a difference. The students will be um, more aware of your presence. I think also you need to be very aware of how you're presenting yourself on the screen too. I have colleagues where I have meetings where, you know, they are, are kind of looking elsewhere. And it's very um, disconcerting when I can only see sort of half of their head or the top of their head, etc. cetera. Um, so as a remote teacher, one of the things that you do need to learn is how to present yourself um, on the camera. Uh, take care that you're not presenting yourself at a weird angle. Um, also, you want to think about lighting, how to illuminate yourself well so people can see you, so you're not in the dark, as if you know, you're know you in this sort of documentary where you don't want to reveal your uh, identity. Um, so obviously backlighting. I've got a lamp which is behind my, uh, my laptop, which is not pointed directly at me because that would actually um, make my um, face look particularly uh, strange. It's actually pointed away, but the light is reflecting on me. So that's one thing you can do. Um, you need to make sure that you're not in the shadows are too dark for the students. If you can face a window or point a light source at you, or, or as I've done with a lamp, then that will help. Right, what else? Now, with this webinar scenario and with a lot of people, most of what you see of me is a talking head. I just my head and shoulders. But actually, when you're teaching a lesson, you don't really want that. I think you want your online lesson to be memorable. So anything you can do to make what you're doing memorable for the students is going to be worthwhile. So I would suggest don't just present yourself as a talking head. Uh, you can stand up. You can move occasionally when appropriate. Um, do what you can do, what you would do normally in a classroom. Obviously, there are constraints, but you wouldn't just sit down in a classroom and uh, be a kind of um, talking body or head to the, your students. If you're teaching more than one students, then make, you know, give them plenty of time to speak. Try building in pair and group work, group work to your lesson. Last week, I could give a one session about um, breakout rooms, which is the way um, when you're teaching online that you can actually manage group work and pair work. And I think you can go and see that recording um, it's available to us, uh, to everybody on the on our website, if you want more advice on how to do that. 
So I think the thing is really is remember just because you're teaching online doesn't mean you shouldn't give the students time to speak and you shouldn't vary your interaction patterns really um, in the same way that you would if you were sitting in the same physical space. So that's an important thing to do. Next, body language. You can't move around the classroom as a remote teacher, but you can use body language in different ways. You can, of course, exaggerate your gestures, gestures and face expressions. Um, and if you don't do that, then a, a lot of what you do will be lost on students, especially if they're looking at small screens. So you need to exaggerate, to gesticulate, use mannerisms, use your posture, your stance to convey confidence or shyness when needed. Um, and it's particularly important to exaggerate when you are uh, teaching online because the it comes across more subtle than if you were physically in the same room as, uh, as your students. I think gestures in particular should be very confident and clear when teaching live online. Students won't capture the smaller subtle gestures, as I said. As I said. Uh, don't slump. And of course, make sure you smile. Not a forced smile, which will make you come across very weird, but a simple smile, I think, will tell your students that you're happy to be there and to be with them. Of course, a lot of these things we already know as teachers, uh, so um, it shouldn't really matter. But I think sometimes the dynamic of teaching online makes teachers forget certain things that they would remember naturally in the classroom. Um, vary your facial expressions, and I think you'll better capture your students' attention. Next, use of voice. So how you use your voice anyway, as we all know, is very important. When you're teaching live online, it's even more important. Your voice is one of the most important valuable assets and the way you use it will help you create a mood, atmosphere and also transmit emotions. You may not be aware how you speak and what your voice sounds like um, and how it can have an impact on the learning outcomes. Uh, but you have to be careful that your voice is not patronising, too loud or monotonous, uh, or the students can respond negatively. Um, on the other hand, if your voice is expressive, lively, then you can draw the students' attention and it's more likely that they'll be engaged and motivated with what you have to say. Uh, what aspects of your voice should be concerned with in order to encourage students to participate and learn? Well, you can vary the volume, speaking softer, or louder, depending on what you're doing, will help you control the class. And controlling the class, having that classroom management at a distance, particularly with younger students, with primary and secondary students, um, is very important, as you can imagine. Uh, but even with adults, you need to be able to capture their attentions, to pull them away from whatever other distractions they have, particularly if they're at home and in a room or a shared space with other people. So changing the tone of your voice is the best way to convey mood or emotion. How, um, how low or high the pitch of your voice is important. Um, if you vary the pitch, that will help. And then vary the pace, of course. How long you pause, how quickly or slowly you speak will have a result in how students react to you. All very important things. The next thing is to minimise distractions. Keeping the attention of the students when teaching online, I think, is uh, quite a challenge. As I said before, if they're at home, they may have many, many distractions. One of the things you should insist upon if you can, and of course that depends on the bandwidth, etc., is uh, try to have them have the cameras on rather than switched off. That way you know at least you have some evidence that they're paying attention, that you can see them, etc. If you if you if the students, I know it's not always possible because of connection problems, etc., or the equipment that students may have. Um, but if the students have their cameras turned off, you don't really know if you're paying attention, if they're paying attention. They may be in the kitchen making something to eat. Um, they may be somewhere else. They may be looking at their mobile, um, answering emails. Who knows? So I think if you have the camera on, that helps. The other thing is minimizing your, your own um, distractions. For example, the background. And we'll come to virtual backgrounds and when and why you want to use them later. But what's behind you on the screen um, during a class normally shouldn't be too busy. Or your students, for example, will be trying to read the titles of the books on the shelves behind you. 
rather than concentrating on what you have to say. Um, so that's important, I think. Use of the camera. Now, there are lots of ways you can use the webcam that may not be obvious. You can obviously reduce, re you can introduce realia through the camera, for example. Does anybody recognize what this is? In the, in the chat, if you think you know what it is, you, there are kind of two answers to that. Can you see it? A pen drive. Yes, Vicky, it's a pen drive. But what does it look like? Can you see what it looks like? It's a, US, it's a sushi. Yes, Robert. Sushi looking pen drive. So there's all sorts of things that you could have access to that you can use the camera uh, for. Um, you know, reality is one good thing. So using real life objects to illustrate vocabulary, etc. One of the great things I saw um, some a remote teacher do was actually get the students to go off and find things in their own houses. So go, go to the kitchen and find an apple. Go to the the uh, the bathroom and find a bottle of shampoo. And that was for Spanish class with vocabulary. I thought it was really interesting to use, just have that kind of, you know, physical movement going on in the class, using what the students have around them, uh, using what you have around them, especially if you're teaching from home, is quite interesting, I think. You can also, of course, <coughs> move your body backwards or forwards. So that way you can actually zoom in or zoom out. Um, if you move yourself out of the view of the camera and show something else, that's one thing you can do. Of course, you can have a small portable whiteboard. I don't have one, but you could have one. Or puppets. Again, I don't have any at hand, especially if you're teaching young learners. You can do all sorts of things like that to make things interesting and memorable, which I think, you know, is the whole point of this. You want, you want your students to learn and have a memorable experience. Having a memorable experience will much better help them learn. Now, the other thing is to be familiar with the technology. Now, a lot of the negative press that, for example, Zoom has got at the moment is because the people who are using it are not very familiar with how it works and how to prevent uh, the Zoom bombing that uh, has been having. You know, the idea of uh, limiting what uh, people can do not making your links too public, particularly if you're teaching, you know, with a public webinar like we have today, we have to do that. But if you're teaching students, there's no real reason why you should make those links public. You should make them specific to the groups of students that you um, you want to have in the room, whatever the platform you're using, if it's Zoom or whatever else. Um, the other thing is, I think if students are registered, if they come in with their own names, um, then that will minimize the chances for any um, negative things uh, happening. I think you need to be familiar with the, the technology to the point where you need to be able to mute students if necessary, if they have a lot of background noise. Um, you need to be able to um, give them access or take away access from things such as the camera, whiteboard, annotating slides, etc. Um, and really, I think the most important thing is there's nothing worse than having students hanging around, twiddling their thumbs, waiting for their teacher to adjust something in the technology. You want to avoid that faffing around and unnecessary waiting by having everything sort of ready and open. All of the resources that you're using, all the websites that you want to show, you ha should um, have it very well. So you don't sort of have students sort of just waiting for you to get ready. You need to be able to uh, have everything ready and switch to it. Uh, the same with, um, I mean, it's all about planning, really. Planning your lessons so students are doing pair work and group work while you're dealing with some technology may be a way of doing it. You have to think it through carefully, especially if you're new to remote teaching. Next, troubleshooting. You always need, and everybody who uses technology should know this, to have a plan B up your sleeve. So sooner or later, if you're a remote teacher, you'll face some technical difficulties. It's going to happen. Um, when this happens, I think it's important that you know basic troubleshooting, so you know what to do, what you should do, maybe switching off your computer and switching it on again, and pre-warning your students that if you um, drop out of the room, then they should hang on and wait while you come back in. 
Um, things like that, I think. Uh, the other thing is usual is that your students may well have technical difficulties, which may be difficult to solve. One of the things you should do before classes or at the beginning of the first class is to have all the students to check their microphone settings and have a plan of action if the microphones don't work. Um, so again, switching the computer off and switching it on again is a very useful way of, um, of fixing a lot of things. Of course, if it's impossible for you to carry out the lesson, perhaps because of connection problems or audio problems, you could try getting the students to take over. You could try using chat. You could, the first thing you would do in Zoom, for example, is turn off the webcams because that takes up a lot of bandwidth. So if everybody turned off the webcams, use chat, etc. Ultimately, you should um, be aware that it may well be necessary to reschedule. One thing you could do, and what we do in the British Council, is we always have an alternative platform. If you have another platform, and as Chris Fry says uh, in the chat, a back channel, something you can use that, where you're all connected, but maybe not as good as the primary uh, platform, for example, Zoom, that you want to use, but something else where at least you can actually do something. That's fine. Ultimately, if it fails, what you could do is record a video, make it available on the LMS, and try to work around so the students don't actually lose the learning, if you like, which is the most, the most important thing. Okay, so that's, those are my tips. That brings us to the end of part one. Does anyone have any tips um, that they might want to share in the chat? Or now is the time you might want to take the microphone. Um, if you let us know, then we can give you the microphone. Tell us about your own challenges, your difficulties, or any tips you may have that I haven't mentioned to keep the students occupied. Again, I'll pick up things in the chat, but if anyone does want to take the microphone and put their hand up in some way or indicate in the chat, then we'll give you access to the microphone to speak. So Rene talks about um, something, one of the things that worked for her was to have a first training session with students explaining technical stuff in classroom rules while on Zoom with young learners and including parents. Yeah, that's a very good idea, Irene. I think that will help a lot. Is there an optimal number of learners for a lesson in Zoom? Asks Nafil. Um, I don't know really. I think you can cope with large numbers of students, but um, the smaller the group, usually as in face-to-face -face teaching, the better really, the more time they're going to have, the more time you have to spend with them, etc. But you can do large classes as well. But obviously I think, um, I'm not sure about an optimal, I don't know if anyone um, in here today has, an, has any thoughts about that. Time span on online connections for students who are seven, eight, nine years old. This is something that's come up. I don't think you would want to, for example, connect with those students, especially if they're younger, for large periods of time. I think 45 minutes is probably a maximum for a class, a live online class. And I would definitely try and move some of the stuff that you would normally do in a face-to-face um, -face classroom to an asynchronous um, platform. So in other words, my personal feeling um, is that you wouldn't want to be sitting there as a teacher and have students spend 10 minutes reading um, if they could do that before before the class. Obviously, you're going to have to be able to, in, you know, make sure that they actually do that for them to get a value of it. You know, with some students, they may, uh, they may not do that. There's a way that you can make them do that before the online class and actually use the online class for speaking and for interaction, and that would be better. Uh, I have unmuted Alana who wants to, to ask hey, a question. Alana. Good, I was starting to lose my voice, so this is good. Let me know. What, what did you have to say, Alana? She's gone all shiny. Oh, I'm, okay. I think I'm unmuted. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, 
I, I had a question about breakout rooms because we've been teaching entirely on Zoom and we've had mixed results with breakout rooms. Sometimes the students love them, sometimes they feel rather abandoned because of course the teacher can't monitor every room at the same time. Sometimes the, mm. it's just an invitation for the students to immediately revert back to L1. Um, I mean, do you have any advice for optimizing the use of breakout rooms? Yeah, it's, it's similar. I think it's similar in a way when you ask students to work in groups or pairs in a physical classroom, isn't it? You do find some of the things that you've said, you find uh, in a face-to-face -face classroom as well. So you find some students who don't speak in English because they're speaking to someone that they have a relationship with in their native language, especially if it's only one native language um, in the whole class. So if it's not a multilingual group. So you would have that problem. I think what you need to do is train the students to use that time to use English as you would in a face-to-face -face classroom. The other thing is then feeling a bit lost. I think you need to sort of gently introduce them to breakout rooms, the concept of it. You'd be working in pairs or groups. I won't be there, but you, I will come and visit you. I'll get around to visiting you. I think the first thing you want to do, especially the first couple of times before they get used to it, is when you put them in pairs, decide very carefully what pairs or what groups you're putting in. So you want to put strong students with weak students, etc., as you would in a normal classroom. But also you want very quickly just to go around and we just go um, into the, each of the breakout rooms very quickly, just say, okay, I want you to speak again as you, as you were doing, I'll be back in a minute. So you're bouncing into the rooms very quickly right at the beginning and then come back and make sure they're on task. As soon as you're, if you hear them speaking, if you hear them doing what you've asked them to do, then bounce into the next room, et cetera. It's, it's a bit of a skill, I think, um, that you need practice with. I don't actually have much experience of doing it myself, just with doing workshops and having breakout rooms in different uh, environments. And I have been in the situation of being put in a breakout room myself with other participants. And then we think, what were we supposed to talk about again? So I think clear instructions is the key to that. Um, really having it's very clear that the students know what they want to do. Maybe you want to put the, stu the, the instructions on your PowerPoint presentation before you do it, get some feedback so they know exactly what you're doing. If you build it into your lesson as you go on, then I mm. think um, mm. that will help. Those are my, my words of advice, but I know it's not, not easy. Don't know if that answers your question, Alan. I think there are some people answering in the chat as well, um, which is good. Okay, I'm going to move on, unless anyone else wants to say anything. Last opportunity for you to take a microphone. Carry on chatting away. This is all good. We'll make the chat log available to everybody as well, and I'll be very interested in, in looking at it. So, moving on. The next section is just about CPD, so continuing professional development for remote teachers. So as we move away from the kind of crisis, ah, the teachers immediately need to start uh, teaching online. What can they do? How can they do it? The kind of emergency uh, training that people need, the self-development of how to do it, etc., which I think, you know, there's a lot of that going on. Um, a lot of people are offering um, you know, tips of how to use different platforms and how best to do this, such as ourselves with today. But then as time goes on, we might find that as teachers, where our expectations, we don't know how things are going to change in the long run. But I would imagine that more of us will end up having to teach online, in which case, perhaps you would be looking for some more sort of um, long term teacher development that can help you um, become a better remote teacher. And one of the things we have um, available, which I recommend everybody who is an IATF or Learning Technology SIG member, who you should have, re you should have received, if you are a member, this book um, in your inbox. It will be available to you. If you haven't, 
then contact us um, and we'll tell you where you can find it. It's also available on Amazon, etc. Um, and it has lots of different um, chapters about digital innovations and research in language learning. One of the chapters which I co-wrote with um, one of the quality managers on the Plants of Bowel in English project, ICR Tusi, was all about continuing professional development for remote teachers. And we did that by looking at our project teachers. We surveyed them. We also took, uh, as I said, Alicia is a quality manager. She was involved in the observation of teachers. Every single teacher on that project gets observed at least once a year. Um, and so she had a very good idea of, from an objective point of view, of the kind of things that teachers needed from observing them. Um, and we also did focus groups, etc. Um, and we came up with a number of things. We based our um, development of teachers on a framework that the British Council has, the Teaching for Success CPD framework. I think it's important to use some kind of framework. This is a self-assessment uh, framework that you can download from the Teaching English website, for example. There are four stages of development here, and it reflects, it, it's meant for teachers to reflect on what they need. We looked at this um, because, of course, this was um, designed for face-to-face -face teachers and tried to adapt it to remote teachers. What did we find? Well, which of the professional practices, the 12 there, uh, do we find are different when remote teaching? The good news is that most of the um, most of the professional practices basically are valid whether you're teaching face to face or online. There's very little difference between that. Obviously, there are some that do vary that need sort of a bit of emphasis, and these are them the ones that we found. So lesson planning. So I've already talked about the importance of having everything available. You're probably using different kinds of materials if you're teaching remotely than you would face to face. So having that ability to find what works, what doesn't work on a screen as opposed to in a classroom is important and being able to choose um, that and adapt. Then classroom management. One of the big areas is classroom management at a distance. It's a very difficult thing to do. I think some of the things that I spoke about today body language, gestures, etc., are important. If you're teaching kids, do you have a responsible adult somewhere in the room that the kids are, are the parents there? If not, how are you going to manage that, etc.? There's all sorts of relationship changes, I think, um, when remote teaching. Uh, you might have, have to have more um, contact with the parents, for example, if you're teaching kids. So managing that interaction part of participation is very important making sure that the children, if the children are safe, but also safeguarding adults, making sure that the adults um, you know, are happy um, with what's going on. They have access to it. So the idea of you know, if you're moving online, does everybody have the kind of equipment and the kind of internet connection that allows them to learn? That's a big, a big thing um, at the moment. There are lots of countries and lots of cases where that isn't the case which case you want to think about alternative ways of providing uh, learning for them. And then learning technologies, of course, as an online teacher, you do need to know, you need to be more comfortable with the technologies. You shouldn't be afraid of it. And there are lots of things you can do to familiarize yourself with the tools that you use. I think they're important. What did we learn? Well, here are some of the findings in the book, just for interest uh, before I move on. So I think a good remote teacher, um, and I'm going to break the first rule of PowerPoint slides as in I'm going to read them, or read some of them. I think some of these are relevant to face-to-face -face teaching anyway, and some of them are specific to online teaching. A good remote teacher adapts the objects of the lesson to the characteristics of the class, culture, age, and needs and interests. Well, you would do that as a face-to-face -face teacher, wouldn't you, as well? Um, anticipates the problems of teaching remotely and thinks of solutions with the classroom teacher. That's there because our particular focus looked at a situation where you'd have a classroom teacher in the classroom with children. Deals with the unexpected. I think you need to be very flexible, um, unprepared. You train the students to use the LMS uh, so they become independent learners. Now is the time to really focus upon that. 
the more the students take responsibility for their own learning, the more you're able to put something on an LMS rather than having them rely upon a teacher to learn it, the more, the more they're going to benefit, I think. Collaborative work, you don't have to just put things in the LMS, for example, uh, for students to do individually. You can build in tasks that they need to actually contact other students, either face-to-face -face or through asynchronously through, um, through email, etc. And it's important. And then some of the things I've already talked about, props, toys, posters, puppets, plays and game, playing games, etc. If they're relevant, if they're going to help the learning, of course, which is the principal thing, gestures, smiling, standing up, uh, not sitting all the time. I think another important thing is that you show that you're confident in control of everything as much as you can do and that you're enjoying yourself. You know, it might not be the thing that you're used to, might not be the thing that you would prefer to do teaching online rather than teaching face to face, but you need to convey that you're very happy with it and also enjoying the lesson. Again, it's something that we'd have to do when we're, um, when we're teaching face to face as well. Having the resources available um, before you start, I mentioned is very important. Being camera aware, being aware that you're actually, you know, you're transmitting to people on the other end of the camera, looking at the camera, making eye contact, as I said before, and trying out new ways of transcending the screen, one of which I'll come to um, in a minute. Those are the things that I recommend. Okay, so transcending the screen. One of the things that Zoom has, and some other tools as well, is virtual backgrounds. Uh, you can probably see some of my colleagues have virtual backgrounds turned on. Um, before we look at some of these and, and the answers, what I have as answers to the questions here, why use them? How would you use them? When would you use them? When would you not use them? What would you use them for? And where do you find them? Um, perhaps you can share what you know about uh, virtual backgrounds in the chat, because I know some of you here already uh, use them. And any information you would like to share put into the chat now would be good. I'm going to continue. Will you go on and, and please uh, share your answers to these questions? For example, Mike says, Michael says it's very good for storytelling. Yeah, definitely. I think one way of doing this is that you can share a screen like I'm doing, or you could actually put something behind you in a virtual background. Um, so there's all sorts of things you can do. I'm going to share a few of the things that I am going to suggest. Um, and then what I recommend everybody do is look at the others, um, look at what people are sharing in the chat as well. So first of all, a very simple way of doing it. Now, I have a green screen, but you don't need a green screen. Um, I have one because the room where I have my um, setup for teaching or teach training or, or virtual, being virtually online, um, is actually quite cluttered and has lots of things in the background, things on the walls. And that doesn't work when you're um, using virtual backgrounds. You need a blank screen. You don't need a green screen, you need a blank wall. If you have anything on the walls or anything interrupting the background, then you'll have problems with the virtual background. It's right next to the camera icon. You've got an up um, arrow, and then you choose virtual background to be able to get to it. There we go. Um, Then you'll get a selection. Now you should find that you have some things already built in, both static images or um, videos, moving images. You can also download them. Uh, if you have a green screen, you can see there you can click on, I have a green screen. You can mirror your video, which um, you might want to do. So mirror your video means like you, it's almost like you're looking uh, at someone in a video. If you're going to display text, you don't want to do that. So I have it left off by default. So obviously you'll get mirror image text if you do that. Um, the best size for your virtual um, backgrounds that I've found is 1280 by 720 pixels. And why would you want to do it? Well, if your background where you're teaching, like my room, is like this, 
then you really want to um, you know do something about it. You don't want to show people um, the room that you're teaching in, maybe. Um, Teams, which is another tool that people use, has a, a way of blurring the background, which is a way. Now, this may seem a bit fun, but which it is, but I think also you, you're also asking students to um, connect with you from home. And perhaps you don't want students to compare other people's home settings, whatever, for social reasons or people may not be comfortable with sharing what their the room where they are, their bedroom or the, the dining room or whatever they, they have their setup. They might be, not be comfortable for doing that. So virtual backgrounds means they don't have to, um, which is another serious reason for using them. What else? So you can display a picture of an ideal room um, or an actual room, but just not the room that you're in. This is an actual room in, in um in our flat but it's not the room i'm actually in now what else might you want to do well there are lots of um images if you search the best way i found is searching on twitter if you search on virtual background zoom backgrounds on twitter you'll find very easily lots of free backgrounds that you can use this is one that some people might remember from a tv interview in the bbc where a little child interrupted the interviewer um you have some standard sort of backgrounds like this is an office background this one um you can have as a static image or a moving background of um of tropical island uh which you know one day once this crisis is all over we'll all be able to travel again to places such as this um you could even have a classroom you know if the students if you think the students would feel more at home with you in a classroom then a picture of your own classroom or a, you know this is a cartoon classroom that i found um you can have stylized art so this is lichtenstein's uh, one of lichtenstein's paintings of a room and of course you can use the pictures behind you in the same way that we'd use on a powerpoint for example to point out things what is this what can you see in the background can anyone spot um an armchair a lamp so you can use it for teaching as well, the backgrounds, which is just another way of varying the dynamic. You don't have to just use a, a presentation. You can use your backgrounds for teaching. Here's one uh, background that I use for a story. So I can, if you do this and you have writing on it, then you do need to make sure that the writing um, is um, obviously visible, that, you, that, teach, that students can read what you're, you have that you're not putting yourself in the way. Here's a virtual bingo that people are starting to do with conference calls. Um, so there's all sorts of things you can do with young learners. You might want to just have something a bit more friendly than the stark plain background that you have behind you. There are all sorts of things you can do. Um, this one would be for primary learners, for example, for older learners, preteens, you might want to have some kind of superhero comic background like this. Um, or something that they might feel comfortable with, make it a bit fun. With adults, you might want to, you know, bring into your class some memes. This, for those of you who don't know, is the most popular documentary on Netflix at the moment. You could get people talking very easily if they're adults, of course, um, with something like this. Um, other memes you might want to bring in. There are all sorts of backgrounds available. I don't know if you recognize this meme, um, but that was quite a... Uh, you can get students, you can make a competition, uh, make it a bit fun, get students to share their favorite backgrounds, find different ones, um, and make it part of the, the warmer um, in class, for example. You can share your photographs. Here is here is um, myself and my wife during happier times when we could actually travel um, in Egypt. Um, you can talk about the photographs. You can personalize your classes with, with them very easily this way. You can get the students to share their own photographs and talk about um, things. And then here's a corporate logo that I have for a particular project, the Continuing Professional Development and Basic Education project that I'm um, co-managing. Um, that I use for professional webinars like that. Um, and that's just basically um, some examples. 
Now, I was hoping to finish a little bit earlier, but we still have five minutes left. Here are my contact details. If anybody would like to write an article or be interviewed for the magazine about what you're doing, whether it be something related to remote teaching or anything else really related to technology, then please get in touch with me. I'm going to stop there and open the floor to questions. Yes, we have a lot of questions. So I have been collecting the questions and I will be passing them on to you to see your opinion, right? Um, yeah. um, so one was uh, mentioned in the chat is build training during the first session. So use the first online sessions also to train students on how to use <laughs> other uh, tools that we are using. So what do you think? Yeah, definitely. And I think it's worth spending uh, part of the first session or the first couple of sessions training the students on how best to use uh, them, what they can expect. You know, do a session. Um, if anyone has, any individuals have particular problems, then what I would do is not waste a lot of the classroom time trying to solve their technical problems there, but actually um, contact them beforehand or after, uh, afterwards um, to solve their particular technical problems. Um, so everybody isn't just twiddling their fingers. But yeah, training the students on how to use the tools is a good idea. Something that has worked well for the school I work for is uh, it's a primary school. We are using a, a, an LMS and Zoom for synchronous sessions. And uh, I have been recording tutorials for, for parents, for students, for teachers on yeah. particular issues that they have so that they can uh, have a, a place to go back to if they have uh, technical issues. Yes, that, that is a very, very good idea. I highly recommend that. I think anything you can do that is sort of a reference um, that you don't need to do live. If you can script something, um, use screenshots and stuff. Um, a bit like the, you know, my pointing you towards how you can, it's very easy to do, mm -hmm. um, pointing you to how to turn on virtual backgrounds, etc. If you can do that and have that available in an LMS, um, if you can, you know, give an introductory video that parents can, can use, that's great. Of course, we're all busy teachers and you might not have time to do that. But I think if you do find the time to do that, it will save a lot of trouble and a lot of time later. So that's a very, very useful uh, tip. Uh, another question is, uh, what would be the optimal number of learners for a lesson in Zoom? I don't know, to be honest. I think, you know, what would be the optimal number of learners for a language lesson in a face-to-face -face okay. class? That would vary depending on the um, the teacher, the types of learners, the age of the learners, the objectives. You know, it may be that you know optimal. Do do you have a choice? Quite often, teachers don't really have a choice of how many learners they have in the classroom. So mm -hmm. you know, I've been in situations where I you know was teaching one to one, which is great, but you know sometimes that's very, it's actually not as good as teaching with a small group of four, for example, four to six, or, you know, eight, ten. Um, there are all sorts of benefits and drawbacks to the numbers. In Zoom, uh, for example, one of the great things about Zoom, as we can see now, is that you get to see all of the pictures or cameras, if you have them, mm -hmm. of all the students together. In other tools such as Teams, you only see at any one moment four cameras or four pictures, which for me is a drawback of that tool. Um, what I said earlier was that you really want everyone who can and has a camera to turn it on. Because, you know, for example, I don't know if that Carol Reed is actually making a cup of tea in her kitchen at the moment rather than listening to me. <laughs> Carol, are you there? Now, there are all sorts of strategies you can do by actually calling on people to show themselves. Ah, you see, she is there. You can see her now. 
And that's Stephen Byrne. Did he pop out to the garden <laughs> to, to walk the dog? And he just wants a certificate for this? Yeah. Or is he actually there? You know? There are things <laughs> to do. Now there are very good re there we go. So some kind of responses. I think that's really important. I didn't mention that, but asking for individual responses, particularly, you know your students. So if you actually know that there are certain students who are more likely to be, you know, not paying attention than others, I'm not mentioning that Stephen and Carol are in that, in that category. <laughs> I, um, I was happy to choose them. But I think, you know, the optimal number of learners, I don't really have a listen. I mean, maybe people here have some, with, ex with more experience than I do, of actually remote teaching as a teacher, um, have a have a view of that. Uh, I, we've been having uh, lessons with up to twenty students, young learners, right. primary. How is that? And they have been working fine. Good. Everybody needs to get used to the dynamics. It's been working. Yeah, I know in Uruguay, for example, there can be twenty-five to thirty students in a class. There's only one camera. Um, so you have all the students in front of you and then remote teachers often do many classes during the day one of the problems with that is that they become it becomes very difficult to learn the students names ah uh, yeah uh we have another question what what types of teaching materials do you use and do they well, and another question related to that is do they have to be a PowerPoint, for example? No, not at all. Um, there are all sorts of things. I mean, the good thing these days is a lot of public, uh, published course books have um, online versions that you can use as a teacher. That, you know, originally a lot of these were meant to be used, a teacher in a classroom on a screen presenting uh, to students in a physical classroom but they, you can do that um, over the classroom online as well. So if you have a course book that has that facility and the students have access to the workbook or student's book, either physically or, or online, then that works really well, I think. Um, in Uruguay, we developed our own materials for the project, um, specifically with a Uruguayan context for that age group, that were meant to be taught in a particular way. But um, you don't necessarily have to uh, do something new. I think a lot of materials can be adapted very well. Even if you have paper course books, if you have the ability to, um, to you know, use the images in some way, you know, of course there are copyright restrictions, but I think most, as I said, most, Course books these days um, allow you to present stuff and have tools and things to do. Um, there are some things that won't work as well as they would work in a classroom. Um, as I said, I wouldn't particularly personally have students come together to read books for 10 minutes or re read an, an article for 10 minutes. However, you may have a good reason for doing that. You know, who am I to tell you how to teach? I think you need to, to do that based on your learners, really. You know your learners. You know what you need to teach them and how they want to, to be learned, etc. That's the important thing, really. Uh, I, ha I think we have time for one more question. And Sandy was asking, what do you do, uh, talking about distractions, right? And what do you do when the responsible adult at home is the one that distracts a child? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I think that's kind of difficult, isn't it? I think um, what you need to do is, hopefully, if you work for an institution, then your institution will have developed guidelines for parents and would have had mm -hmm. contact with parents. I would hope that if the institution, organization, language academy, school, whatever it is, is actually organizing online teaching, then they'll be providing a platform for you, they'll be providing an LMS, they'll be giving guidance as, as they would do normally. And part of that guidance, I think, would be guidelines for parents of, you know, during the online lesson, what you should and shouldn't do, 
and the teacher really might want to establish a, a more a closer one-to-one -one relationship with parents because of this but I think you need to have some some things in place that said it doesn't always happen does it you know so you might have the guidelines in place but then they're not respected or enforced and I think you would then need to take a make a decision as a teacher whether you could solve that by you know you know perhaps there are all sorts of situations that could happen. It could be an adult in the room with a child or a teenager, um, which potentially could be a good thing, but that adult is then interrupting the class or telling the, the you know, or trying to manage, pay attention, Rodrigo or whatever. Um, so there are all sorts of things. I think as a teacher, you need to be sensitive to, okay, how do I deal with this? Do I deal with it now? Do I deal with it later? Do I deal with it by talking to the student? Do I deal with it by talking to the parent? Do I go to my organization to get them to do it? I think a lot depends on the context. It's very difficult to give general guidelines. Well, thank you very much. I think uh, this is it. Uh, we've had a wonderful Good. session, lots of questions, lots of interaction in the chat box. Good. And thank you, Graham. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you, colleagues of the LTSIG, for being present, for moderating, and, and, and every, all of the support that you give all of us anyway. Um, and we'll continue, hopefully, to see everybody next week for yeah. another LTSIG Friday. Yeah, next Friday. Be here. Mm. Thank you. And what would be wonderful if every one of us could come on webcam now and then give us a bit of a clap so that we can take a picture for those out there, the big clapping. <laughs> that would be awesome. Thank you so much. And lovely to see you all. That is fantastic. <laughs> Let me take a picture. Hang on. <laughs> a screenshot would be better, but perhaps. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs> lovely. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Everybody. Thank, you. you all. Thank you. Take care. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Stay at home. <laughs> Don't go anywhere. Oh. Next week, Friday, is yeah. LT6 Friday. <laughs> and I've, I forgot to reveal my, my secret weapon. I oh. Oh, oh, look at that. that. <laughs> The oh, green just, shirt! Oh, the green shirt! <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, oh, I'm talking it. <laughs> that is awesome. Come on, Graham. Graham, you need to share. How do you